I work as a foresight specialist and this means that I uh, analyze different future phenomena and do different kind of projects that will then uh, enhance the positive side of these trends. And in this talk I will cover three topics. So uh, I'll tell you some examples from Finland. What is the public debate uh, like in terms of climate change and climate action. Where are we at the moment? Then I will tell you about Citra's vision, the next era of well-being. And thirdly, I will introduce you a book called Sustainability, Human Well-Being and the Future of Education. But this is my guiding principle for my talk. So, less fear and apathy more hope and action. So do we see the future as the image on the left or on the right? What would need to happen that we would see the future? Let me see. Left and right, yeah? So what would need to happen that we would see it more like this green, uh, green happier version? Our mindsets and future images guide our decisions and actions so less fear and apathy, more hope and action. Uh, then just a couple of words about the Finnish Innovation Fund. Uh, so we are a think and do tank established in 1967, located in Helsinki in Finland. And we call ourselves a think and do tank because on top of surveys and research, we also do quite a lot of hands-on projects with our partners to support the transition to a sustainable well-being society. And uh, this means that uh, we want to see a society that operates within the planetary boundaries and that's first goal is holistic well-being. And we work towards this goal with our five different thematic areas that are foresight that I represent societal training, carbon neutral circular economy, capacity for renewal, and new working life and sustainable economy. So Finland is a small country, only 5.5 million people. Uh, but Citra's thinking is that we can in many ways be bigger than our size. We can um, provide tools, solutions, information and inspiration on global arenas as well. So the themes that we're working with are very big and ambitious. So how do we do this? What kind of tools do we use? One is sense making, so producing new information and making sense of it in different forms. Our megatrend work uh, is a really popular product and a good example of this category. Then starting a societal debate and spreading awareness, uniting people and organizations, giving a platform for others to find each other. Systemic societal change does not happen without commitment from different actors. Practicing trials and pilots, you might have heard about um, the Finnish basic income experiment, so uh, it was not Citrus project, but we were one part of that pilot spreading and establishing new operating models, uh, building a political and administrative foundation to, for change and influencing decision making. Then who do we work with? Uh, here's a picture that describes pretty well our theory of change. In order to create systemic change, the type of change that simultaneously reforms operational models, structures, and their interactions, we need to work with many different stakeholders and sectors. Systemic thinking and change understands the complexity uh, of the society that we now live in and the complexity and uncertainties of wicked problems such as climate change and the loss of biodiversity. If we want to solve these problems, we have to work phenomena-based, not silo-based. Whoops. Okay, I'm back. Let me see. No. I wasn't prepared for that. Yes. 
Okay, so this means, for instance, with uh, climate change, that almost all of this, uh, actually all of these sectors are needed in order for us to get something concrete done. But when we talk about systemic change, we also need to understand what drives people's behavior, uh, how change happens on a psychological level. We also need to be realistic in a way that there might be a very long way from awareness to commitment and actual changes in behavior and consumption. And in order to create systemic change, there needs to be visions, goals and future images uh, that motivate and inspire. Since we live in pluralistic societies, there needs to be many different visions that compete with each other. Also, visions cannot be made top down, but the process of making the vision needs to be inclusive and open. So Sitcha's vision, the next era of well-being, builds on the Nordic societal model's achievements, but acknowledges that it was built to succeed in the industrial era and does not operate in an ecologically sustainable way in the post-industrial societies we now live in. Since 2012, we've worked what we call sustainable well-being, and it's our vision as an organization, but also a discussion opener for Finland and more broadly for our international networks. In a nutshell, we are saying that we should transition to a society that operates within the planetary boundaries and that first aim is holistic well-being. And we have also wanted to influence the Finnish societal discussion uh, about uh, different visions and to be more future-oriented. So we've promoted discussion about these visions and challenge also different responsible actors and orga organizations to tell what kind of society are you actually building with your work. Also, Citra is a pretty unique organization and we have projects ranging from human-centric data economy to circular economy. So we need to have a pretty clear picture of what is the big goal that all of these projects will lead to. So one central goal and aspect of vision is creating hope and action. Everyone worrying about the changes taking place in our society from climate change to employment, from inequality to security, should feel that we also have a responsibility to create a better future. And uh, for the world, uh, the last 200 years have been an amazing story of progress if we look at it as a whole. In year 1820, from 100 people in the world, one would have lived in a democratic society. Now, from 100 people, 56 lives in a democratic society. And in 1820, 17 people from 100 was educated. Now, 86 people from 100 are educated. Of course, there are tremendous inequalities between countries and inside countries, but the big, big picture uh, of progress is, is pretty clear. But then when people were asked in different countries, does is life better now than 50 years ago? A significant share of people in uh, Western countries uh, are of the opinion that life was actually better 50 years ago. Um, and um, this, here we come to the question that have people actually lost faith for future or why do we get results like this? So uh, over the last 10 plus years, a significant number of different megatrends have entered the knowledge of people. And we are examining the trends and thinking that what does this mean for me and my family or me and my community? What will my future look like? Megatrends have brought us to a situation in which the basic societal uh, rules of thumb and kind of like inbuilt promises no longer seem to uh, work as they did before. So the nature of work has changed and it no longer offer offers like a sec secure looking prospects of a rising long-term income as before. Economic growth does not seem to generate as evenly distributed and like a concrete feeling of progress in people's everyday lives as it used to. The future looks uncertain, uncertain and we have to create 
a credible vision uh, of future income, inclusion and progress. So uh, citrus megatrend materials have been read more than 350,000 times. So we can say that Finnish people are really interested in what kind of powers will shape the future. But the next question is, what then? In worst case scenario, people just get more anxious about the future when it feels that automatization will develop, uh, and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so, the, so the question is that how do we respond to these megatrends? Um, what does climate change mean for specific organizations and individual people? And here we also come to visions and to the power of taking steps to influence the future. The future is not fixed, and despite the uncertainty, there is always something we can do ourselves to guide the future to the direction we want to see. We also have like a practical toolkit where we have uh, put together all, uh, all our tools about making these visions. There's also like foresight, um, different kind of foresight exercises, and it's going to, going to be translated and uh, going to be ready soon, so I'm really happy to share that with you. So the next era of well-being uh, is a vision of a well-being society that operates within the planetary boundaries, as said, and the key, key questions of it are, what does this sustainable well-being society look like at the level of social policy and at the level of people's everyday lives? So the vision is constructed of four elements, values and ideals, megatrends, social policy, and people's everyday lives. And I will now take you through these four, four categories uh, quickly. So the Nordic societies emphasize ideals such as equality, autonomy, gender equality, strong rule of law, democracy, and fairness. And these values, of course, cannot be considered self-evident, but they need, to talk, they need to be talked about and defended. And this is why we put them into the core of the vision. And this quote is from Financial Times from April 2018. And it dealt with um, how Emmanuel Macron has shifted his gaze from US towards the Nordics when looking for inspiration for different reforms that he wants to execute in France. And this is quite a change if we th uh, think that for decades United States has been the number one source for benchmarking different policy reforms. So the Swedish political scientist Bo Rothstein writes that it's now clear from the many societal models that have been tried since the break breakthrough of industrialism, social research can point to a winner in terms of human well-being. And this is the Nordic model. So the core of the Nordic mm, tradition is an exceptionally strong trust in people's ability to learn and grow throughout their lives. And this is a picture of a Finnish baby box. Uh, and the box captures something quite essential of the Nordic societal model. So the baby box is given to all expecting mothers or mothers adopting a baby. And the box is funded from tax money. Uh, it was first targeted to poor mothers and families, but in 1949, all mothers started getting the baby box. And the baby box crystallizes in a concrete m uh, form the Nordic model's aim towards universalism, equality, and a fair start for every family and baby. And then we come to megatrends after values. So uh, we think that these three plus three megatrends are the phenomena that we need to respond to and that form the boundaries and the space uh, in, in which we need to operate. So the megatrends are sustainability crisis now, global interdependency with growing tensions, technology changes everything. And then the 2017 megatrends, the riddle of work and income, representative democracy fatigued, and the economy at the crossroads. And these all demand attentions, attention, and often we also uh, deal with one megatrend at a time, but we should actually focus to all of them in a systemic way because they are all linked. So what does this mean in terms of social policy? How do we take steps from megatrend 
strengths to them actually guiding the development work and projects we do in our societies. So here are some guidelines from the next era of well-being vision. So we must operate within the Earth's uh, planetary boundaries. That the new phase in geopolitics requires investments in international cooperation and international institutions are seen as sources of stability. And that the rapid technological development does not only mean that there's going to be more unemployment, but it can also be harnessed su to support progress. Here we go again. Sorry about that. Yes. So to become reality, the next era of well-being calls for progressive social policy. The three elements of it are circular economy, lifelong learning, and progressive administration and leadership. So circular economy uh, refers to the need to change the entire economic system so that we can produce and consume within the planetary boundaries. So circular economy is an economic model in which consumption is based on sharing, um, uh, using services, sharing, renting, and recycling instead of owning things. And then about lifelong learning, our lifespans are getting longer and longer. Uh, we have big pressures uh, to shift our lifestyle to be more sustainable. And formal education is heavily focused to early year, years in indi individuals' li lives. But ca it cannot be assumed anymore that the educational fruit accumulated early in life will necessarily carry a person throughout the lifetime. So we need a policy shift in creating a system of lifelong learning that touches all people regarding of their socioeconomic status. And there's very few examples of like national uh, uh, lifelong learning systems. Uh, there's one in interesting example in Singapore. Uh, they started the this Skills Future program in 2016. And we're trying to build a system at the moment in Finland as well. Uh, then progressive administration and leadership. So climate change or inequality, they do not really care about which ministry is supposed to handle it. So we need, need to make a shift to an administration that works together with citizens and across administrative silos. Then about people's everyday lives. This is a picture of the creator of Moomins, artist Tuve Jansson. She is at her summer cottage with her spouse um, in Kluvharu. And Moomin Valley is for many Finns like a symbol of a happy, happy place, uh, good life surrounded by beautiful nature. And in this next era of well-being vision, we're not exactly aiming to live in a Moomin Valley, uh, but despite this, if we look at how these social policy actions I named would translate into people's everyday lives, uh, there are some similarities to Moomin Valley. Firstly, people feel that they are being hurt. They can strengthen the democracy together. And this includes uh, a sense of belonging to a community, solving wicked problems such as climate change and inequality together. Also, uh, people would have confidence to basic social security and work. So this was the next era of well-being vision. And next I will move to how is the public discussion in Finland in terms of climate change and ecological crisis at the moment. Uh, especially after the IPCC report released fall 2018, there's been a significant peak in how much the topic is discussed in media and in uh, daily discussions between people. Also, it was one of the biggest uh, uh, discussion topics in our parliamentary elections that happened early May. So we're witnessing a big moment of ecological awareness, and of course there's been many organizations doing work with this theme for decades. So the IPCC report stated that the risks of two degree warming are catastrophic. Coral reefs would be diminished by 99%, the Greenland glaciers might collapse, and the impact of um, to normal people's daily lives would be very visible around the globe. But the report also had a significant like a message of hope. 
So it is possible to stay in 1.5 Celsius global warming, but there needs to be steps taken immediately at all sectors, also education. The emission commitments that countries have now made would take us to three degrees warmer planet. And if we look at the couple of barometers from 2018 and 2019, we can see that people are very worried about climate change and ready for more ambitious climate politics in Finland. In future barometer, we ask 2,000 Finns about their knowledge and attitudes towards three trends. So ecological crisis, the difficulties of democracy, uh, and the fast developments of technology and changing working life. And the ecological crisis was most well known to people and also seen as the biggest threat. So 82% of Finns answered that uh, ecological cr crisis is either very familiar or familiar to them. And 82% also saw is a big or quite big threat. And 58% of people saw possibilities in ecological crisis. The results of climate barometer are also that 70% of those who answer answered hope that the new government in Finland, that we will get the government program tonight or tomorrow, uh, that uh, they will mitigate climate change more effectively. And there had been almost a 20% increase since 2015. Another point is that uh, in 2015, 29% of the respondents said that they had changed something in their everyday life in order to be more sustainable. Uh, now the figure was 41%, so um, some increase there as well. And then the youth barometer asks 15 to 29 year olds their opinions to a wide range of questions. And compared to year 2015, youth's concern about climate change had risen from 39.5% to around 70 now in 2018. Also, Citra has done this lifestyle test uh, that gives the user his or her carbon footprint. So the test is easy and quick to do. And after taking the test, uh, the user gets tips, uh, tips tailored for him or her on how to adjust uh, his or her lifestyle to mo a more sustainable direction. And the test has been taken more than 700,000 times, which is uh, quite a big number since Finland only has 5.5 million people. But it's also in English, so of course there's some foreigners, foreigners as well. So the popularity of the lifestyle test and other signals suggest us that people are more and more asking that what can I do, uh, how can I make, uh, make something concrete. And this is great because 68% of emissions can be led back to individual consumers' choices. In what kind of apartments we live in, uh, where do we travel, how do we travel, uh, what we eat and so on. Therefore, we can reduce these impacts also by everyday day-to-day uh, -day choices we make. But people also need easy and quick ways to understand how can they make impact and what is the most impactful way for them. So after taking the lifestyle test, uh, there's this other service that you can then then go to, and it's called Commitment 2050. It's done by Citra and the Finnish Prime Minister's Office. And there people and uh, organizations then can do commitments on how many percentages they want to uh, cut their own carbon uh, footprint. And the idea behind this Commitment 2050 is that it's, it's not enough that you uh, make a decision that yes, now I have to do something. Uh, but you actually need a concrete plan. You have to put it into your calendar and, and say that, okay, I will only eat vegetarian food or I will start bicycling or whatever suits, suits uh, your lifestyle. So the idea is to make it a habit, uh, make it part of your weekly calendar. There is now around 1,000 commitments made, uh, so not a lot yet. And the average cut that these commitments make to carbon footprints is around 20%. So it's not enough, but it's a good start. So to make it possible for people to reach 0 0.7 carbon dioxide tons footprint uh, in 2000, uh, 
50 that is needed if we want to stay in the path of 1.5 Celsius warmer planet and not more. There needs to be also, of course, political will, investments, infrastructure in place that makes sustain sustainable living possible. But a lot can be done already. And many people who have done the lifestyle test have been quite surprised about the big share that transportation plays uh, in the overall carbon footprint. And this is especially true if the user has flied abroad during the last year uh, for more than once. But 44% uh, of those who have taken the test have not flied at all during the last year. There is also interesting signals re regarding air travel. In Sweden, uh, flight shame is uh, discussed as a cultural phenomena. Also in Sweden, the sales of interrail train tickets had risen by 90% compared to a year ago. In Finland, there is also travel events that focus on traveling by train and so on. So all in all, uh, the knowledge um, about the ecological crisis in Finland is pretty, uh, pretty good. But we have to remind ourselves about the situation where we are at at the moment. And here you can see a little bit of Finnish writing as well. So this slide shows the scale uh, of the needed change on a personal level. So the average carbon footprint of a Finn is around 10,000 uh, tons of carbon dioxide at the moment, when it should be a third of that, 3,000 tons by 2030. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we released a study in Citra that says that by 2050, the average footprint should be less than 1,000. 1, so we should actually make our carbon footprint 10 times smaller than the average one is right now, if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees. So the next few years are probably the most important in our history said Deborah Roberts, uh, one of the persons who have worked with the IPCC report. Uh, the situation is not hopeless, but demand immediate action at all sectors. Before the cl uh, Paris uh, climate negotiations, CITRA conducted a study called Green to Scale, and we wanted to know how much we could lower the emissions just by scaling, scaling up 17 existing low-carbon solutions internationally. For example, scaling up Denmark's way of minimizing food waste in the USA or taking into use Finnish bioenergy solutions in Canada, we could lower emissions globally by 25%. That's a lot. In another Green to Scale report that focused on Nordic solutions, we found out that scaling up the selected Nordic solutions, we could cut global emissions by 4.1 gigatons in 2030. So the re reduction is equal to the current total emissions of the European Union. The price of taking these um, solutions into use equals the sum that is now spent on subsidizing fossil fuels in just nine days. That's pretty amazing to me in just nine days. So my message here is that there are already pr uh, a lot of proven low carbon solutions available at an affordable cost. Then I will move to the third part of my presentation. So a book called Sustainability, Human Wellbeing and the Future of Education that ex explores what does this all mean for education. Uh, when we started this project, we wanted to better understand what kind of role edu education sector sorry. Hmm. I think I did something here. So what kind of role edu education sector plays uh, in the transition to a sustainable well-being society? Uh, what is the readiness to tackle challenges like 
this. And the key message of the book is that building a sustainable future is, is the most important task of schools and our education systems. And that this is a big challenge that needs to be taken more seriously in schools. The big book is also a free open access ebook. So if you Google the name, you will find the book either on Palgrave Macmillan's page or Citrus webpage. And the book has now reached uh, more than 85,000 downloads, which I'm very happy about. So maybe we get some more uh, tonight if you go and download it. Uh, you can either download individual articles or the whole book. Uh, uh, the book consists of 11 articles uh, by 15 different writers and half of the writers are from Finland and half of the writers are American. Here you can see the writers as well. So this slide is a very important starting point for the whole project. In the face of climate change, every everybody is an environmentalist. It's a quote from Stuart Brand. So we're facing an unknown frontier and we don't have any straightforward guidelines uh, that would tell us what to do. But we need to figure out it together, a climate-friendly education system uh, of a post-industrial society. That what does it look like? Um, so the biggest trends affecting education uh, are the need for sustainability as well as the rapid development of technology. In terms of technology, there's very interesting possibilities. For example, when self-driving cars become more used, that could mean that we could have much more time for learning when the hours that were previously spent, spent driving could now be uh, time for learning. Of course, there's quite big challenges as as well in terms of technology, but um, also possibilities. The research question of all of the uh, writers have, has been this one. How do we enable students, schools and communities to become a building blocks of a sustainable well-being society? And the key messages from this book are this, these four. So schools should educate students who have skills, capabilities and attitudes to address grand challenges like climate change or global inequality. And that the students feel and think that they can be part of the solutions. They have the skills and attitude. But to fully embrace this, sustainability would need to be more integrated into teachers, students and teachers uh, study programs. We know from several studies and reports that teachers and teacher students feel that they don't have the adequate knowledge to work with these issues with their students. The themes feel overwhelming, cause anxiety, and no one really has the ownership of sustainability issues in school. It can still be a couple of recycling days here and there, but it needs to be a more strate strategic approach. What can teachers then do to create hope and prevent apathy? Perspectives on this issue is presented in the book uh, in an article about climate change education by Anna Lehtonen, Arto Salonen and Hannele Kantel. And they highlight, for example, the meaning of art, phenomena-based learning or project-based learning, and dealing with difficult feelings and questions together in an open manner. When people can openly share their fears uh, and doubts, it's easier, easier also to build ground for new thinking and solutions. Uh, schools are organized uh, into subject-oriented structures and teaching environmental issues is traditionally the domain of natural sciences and the human perspective and societal understanding as well is often missing. Here the project-based learning that is link, linked to systemic thinking can be a good solution and already practiced in, in the progressive schools. But to grow into a change maker th that can contribute to the society and to our global problems, you also must be aware of the factors that affect your thinking, that affect your behavior and worldview. And in the book, these uh, issues are, are examined by Harold Glasser and Erkka Salminen. Then a future-oriented and purpose-driven discussion in the field of education is needed, and it needs to be inclusive 
also for people outside of education sector. John Dewey has written that the conception of education as a social proce process and function has no definite meaning until we define the kind of society we have in mind. Thus, we need to ask ourselves what is actually the purpose of education in a complex world that we now live in, and how does education help us prepare kids for the future when, when uh, uh, kids who are now in the first grade will most likely to be in working life still in year 2080. Then the third message is that cooperation between schools and the rest of the society needs to be strengthened so that schools are not in isolation uh, from other actors in the society. But this is not only schools' responsibility, but the wider project. And there's a good example in the book uh, about how this cooperation is done really well. So Rob Riordan writes in his article about high-tech high schools. He's one of the founders of these schools in California, where the pedagogy is based on strengthening the agency of students and real-world connections. This, this school type, these schools are uh, well presented in a documentary called The Most Likely to Succeed. So in High Tech High, most of the learning happens in projects that combine, for instance, physics and literature. So the projects are based on kids' questions uh, about things that occupy their mind. So after going through these questions like why am I angry or why is there hatred in the world, uh, a common theme for a project uh, is narrowed down from these, this pool of questions. And students have Students have, for example, made projects that have resulted in an economics textbook and a machine that can recognize different species from DNA samples. It's interesting also that even though uh, they cannot cover all of the materials that are usually required for SATs, these tests, these uh, students still perform better than the average students. Uh, an important part of high-tech high schools are or also the exhibitions uh, done each semester. So for one evening, the whole community uh, comes together to look at these projects that the kids have done. And this brings like a component of seriousness to the work that they are doing. Then the fourth message, uh, fourth message transitioning to a sustainable well-being society requires a lot from uh, schools and education. So it's a really big challenge. And when you look at the age pyramids, we also live longer. Uh, in Finland, the age pyramid is such that uh, the amount of under 25 year olds is only 27%. Uh, so we need, need to look at uh, lifelong learning to focus on that and to include uh, everyone, uh, every aged person uh, to the to the big project of making the transition to a sustainable society. But when we look at the different articles, what kind of skills are repeated in these different articles? This is a list that we formed. So problem solving, working together, critical thinking, creativity, empathy, systems and design thinking, global literacy, and learning to learn. Uh, probably most of these skills are pretty self-describing, but uh, global literacy might be something new. Um, so according to the OECD PISA Global Competence Framework, global competence is a multidimensional capacity. So globally competent individual can examine local, global and intercultural issues understand and appreciate different perspectives and worldviews, interact successfully and respect respectfully with others, and take responsible action towards sustainability and collective well-being. And in the end, I will take a closer look to two of the articles in the book. The first one is Asta Rami's article, Towards Solving the Impossible Problems. So Asta explores how we can make better decisions and be more creative in problem solvi solving. Skills that the megatrends uh, and wicked problems of our time desperately needs. She writes that wicked sol uh, problem solving and radical breakthrough innovation called for new thinking skills. In complex problem solving and in uncertain world, reasoning and rational thinking are not enough. 
but uh, developing intu intuition has become an important skill. And there are four different ways of knowing and acquiring information through authority, reason, experience and noetic knowing. In schools, information transmission is mostly based on the first two, uh, authority and reason. This can be labeled uh, external ways of knowing, and even though experience is a common way of knowing and learning, it's not usually very well integrated into formal education. So noetic knowing is in turn mostly uh, excluded from our formal education system. But intuitive information, uh, yeah, it's embedded in these two forms of knowing. When it seems that their research is not going anywhere, the best science experts in the world practice their thinking skills and take their intuition into use. And Asta Rami has several examples in, um, in her article about scientific breakthroughs that have been made and finalized with uh, using intuition. And most of the skills related to internal knowing are trainable. Smart intuition can be integrated with sharp reasoning and education. Then an article by Erkka Laininen, transforming our worldview towards a sustainable future. So Erkka writes in his article that reaching sustainability means that we have to do quite a lot of unlearning, learning away from harmful thinking, behavior, lifestyle and economic model. And Laininen suggests that we need transformative learning. Transformative learning involves experiencing a deep structural shift in the basic premises of thought, feelings and actions. It's a shift of consciousness that dramatically and permanently alters our way of being in the world. This means uh, taking a helicopter view and seeing fully that a number of alternatives or paradigms exist and can be chosen from. So to solve the problems at hand, reformistic way of developing the school is not enough. What is needed is innovative learning that changes the way we see the relationship between humans, nature and well-being, as well as economy. In schools, there should be critical evaluation of dominant values, perceptions and worldviews as well. But to conclude, what is sustainable education? It's education that prepares people to face the 1.5 Celsius world. It's education that supports the transition to a society that operates within the planetary boundaries. It's education that gives students capabilities that they need in order to cope and have well-being in a complex world. An education that is future-oriented and also sus socially sustainable. And I want to end my presentation with the same picture I started with. So climate crisis is something we, whoop, one more. Yes. Yeah. So climate crisis is something we people in the history and we now have made to the to the planet, but it's also something we can solve. The situation is serious and needs immediate actions from all sectors in the society, big and small organizations, politicians, businesses, and from us individuals. We humans have managed to stop global ozone depletion. Lifespans have nearly doubled uh, in the last century, and the universal education system and medical care have been achieved in many countries. So we can do this, but we need to do it now. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>